So you wanted me to wanted me to read a scripture verse and then pray for you? Yeah. Yeah, read the whole scriptures. It's uh, the scriptures come from Matthew 18. If you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to Matthew 18 verses 21 through 25. Matthew 18 21 to 35. Here's 19 copies he wanted me to print out. Uh, parts of the of the lesson. So if you want to pass them out, there's 19. There's, there's three sheets on here. So why don't you pass them out, one per family or individuals, maybe just. <clears throat> Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. But forasmuch as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found out found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou earst. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, <clears throat> Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but it went out and cast him into the prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you, from your hearts, forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Thank you, Lord God, for your word. Thank you, my brother Craig, Lord God, the word that you've laid on his heart. And Lord, I'm asking that you would fill him, Lord God, with your anointing, Lord God. I'm asking for reservoirs to be opened up out of him, Lord God, that out of his belly would flow rivers of living water. We thank you that he has a relationship with you, Lord God. And we pray, God, that, that, that angelic host would ascend and descend with, Lord God, today with fresh revelation from your throne. And today, Lord God, I pray that our hearts would be opened. Our hearts would be opened that the word of God, when it comes forth, would bear forth fruit. As, it, as we go from this place today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I guess I got this one here. <clears throat> on uh, Friday morning, we were gathered for prayer, and we were discussing some things that... Uh, I think we're very uh, very deep and as we were leaving Aaron asked me he said uh, would you like to preach <laughs> and I said well I, I really don't think I, I I got so many things on my plate right now I don't think I can. It's not that I didn't have the time this morning. It's just that I felt like I had so much going on in my life that I felt overwhelmed. And then I had made a comment to him about a message that I had preached several weeks ago. And he said, my people need to hear that. <laughs> and... So I will introduce this message by telling you the title. The title is The Role of Forgiveness in Deliverance. I don't know if you ever made that connection before. The Role of Forgiveness in Deliverance. I've asked him to pass out a couple of pages uh, one page is an outline of the message so that you can take it home and think about it again. And then there are two other papers 
that uh, go along with the message. One has to do with the difference between forgiveness and unforgiveness because there's a lot of confusion about that. And the other one is a, a way to examine your own heart to see if you have any kind of bitterness buried deep within. With that said, I want to take you back a few years in history. In October of 2006, tragedy of the most horrific kind struck Lancaster County and the Amish community. Do you know what I'm referring to? The Nickel Mines shooting. The Nickel Mines shooting not only got attention in the local paper, but also it was broadcast all across the world. In fact, I do not know if you are aware of this, but there are some professional journalists who are in the process of filming a documentary on forgiveness that is going to be used in the Muslim community in the Middle East and that the nickel mines shooting experiences is one of the major stories contained in that documentary. I would like to read from the paper a portion of an article that, that was written about that event. This section is called Automatic Forgiveness. The Amish are keenly aware that their response to this tragedy immediately forgiven Roberts, meeting with his widow, comforting his children, attending his funeral, has made a huge impact. The name of Jesus is being spread all over the world through this, acknowledged an Amish man near Georgetown. He stroked his beard and smiled. Isn't that something, he exclaimed. It's ironic. We as a backward people are showing the way toward forgiveness. The aspect of the Amish community's forgiveness that has surprised many people is its seemingly spontaneous nature. Forgiving is automatic on all occasions. Precisely one week before Roberts walked into the schoolhouse, the Amish community buried another Bart Township youth. A hit-and-run driver struck and killed a 12-year-old Emmanuel King. The King family forgave the driver long before the police could complete their investigation. The basis for Amish forgiveness is found in Jesus' words on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Wrote an Amish correspondently shortly after Robert struck the, the schoolhouse, O oh Lord, forgive him, he knew not what he was doing. Another Amish man working in this shop near Georgetown explained forgiveness in a different way. We can't receive forgiveness if we don't give it. But the Amish want everyone to understand that they are not perfect in their forgiving. The very human impulse to despise evil and the evildoer tends to assert and reassert itself. We have to forgive again and again, said Amish woman in her parlor at Nickel Mines. Like the Bible says, not just seven times, but seven times seventy. We have to forgive every day. It's not easy. We have to work at it. How many of you agree with that? We have to work at it. Uh, we're on the same page. <laughs> we're on the same page. What does work at it look like? 
And what, we, what do we need to know about it? In today's scripture, Jesus teaches the importance of forgiveness. And in doing so, he reveals the role of forgiveness and deliverance. In today's passage, he tells a parable of a king who wants to settle debts with his chief steward who owes him a lot of money, a hundred pence. He forgives the man his debt and tells the man to forgive others their debt who has owed him money. But instead of doing that, he refuses to forgive them of their debt. And as a result, the king is angered, throws him in prison. But that's not the end of the story. What does it say? He's in prison, but he's turned over to the tormentors. Now, the tormentors is a biblical euphemism for demons. Who torments you? Demonic spirits. The tormentors are what Jesus came to overcome. In John 10.10, 10, Satan, it says, has as his purpose to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus has come that you might have life and have it abundantly. There is, a dis, there is a direct connection between abundant life, health, prosperity, and forgiveness. In Psalm 103, verse 3, it declares this about God. God forgives all our sins and heals all our diseases. In John 3, verses 1-2, John prays that you, or the hearers, would prosper and be in good health as your soul prospers. If you are being tormented by demons because of unforgiveness, is your soul prospering? No. Not at all. Studies have shown that the act of forgiveness can be a huge reward for your health. It lowers heart attacks, improves cholesterol levels, sleep, increases sleep, reduces pain, reduces high blood pressure, levels anxiety, depression and stress and research shows to an increase that as you get older you will remain in good health if you have a forgiving spirit can you see that if you can maintain a forgiving spirit over your life as you age you will remain in good health There is an enormous physical burden to being hurt and disappointed, says Dr. Karen Swartz, an MD and the director of Mood Disorder Adult Consultation in Johns Hopkins Hospital. Chronic anger puts you into a fight and flight mode, which results in enormous change. Thank you. Enormous change in your heart rate, in your blood pressure, and in your immune system. Those changes then increase your risk at depression, heart disease, diabetes, and other illnesses. Forgiveness, however, calms stress, levels you out into a more mellow state, and improves your health. 
Forgiveness is not just about saying the words. It's an active process in which you make a conscious decision to let go of your feelings whether the person deserves it or not. Dr. Schwartz says, as you release anger, resentment, and hostility, you begin to feel empathy, compassion, and sometimes even affection toward the person who hurt you. The kind of forgiveness is from the inner person. It's not simply from the head, but from the inner person, the soul of a person. This is what Jesus was referring to at the end of the passage when he says, forgive people from your heart. Forgiving from your heart is different than forgiving from your head. When you forgive from your head, you simply do it because you know you're supposed to, right? That's automatic forgiveness. But there's a whole lot more kind of work that needs to happen besides saying, I forgive you, in order for forgiveness to really take root in your heart. How many, you all know that we're supposed to forgive, right? How many of you find it easy? No, not many. <laughs> exactly. Sometimes you do. Yeah, some, sometimes it's easy. But if it's really a, a difficult circumstance, if the pain is real deep, or if the people who are real close to you betray you, ah, uh, that gets real tough, doesn't it? I suspect that many of you, and this is where we, <laughs> where we had our conversation on Friday, have been deeply hurt and wounded. How many of you have been put into the bond? Rejected, shunned, excommunicated. Has that hurt? People who have in your own family People who you were raised with in your own community reject you. Why? Because you believe more of what God has to say in the scriptures. Not because you've done something terrible and evil. But because you just don't go along anymore with a religious spirit. But nevertheless... You can forgive from your head. But how many of you have buried deep within your heart some resentment, some anger, some bitterness? Okay. We want to get rid of that today. Because it's that resentment that opens the door for demonic torment. And keeps you from being in good health. And keeps you from prospering. This is why this message, I believe, is very important. Forgiveness is more for you than it is for the person who hurt you. You got to understand that. The definition of deliverance is to rescue, to liberate, to set free someone or something. The word deliverance is recorded in the scriptures 383 times. It is usually done in the context of someone being rescued from danger, from bondage, from judgment, from sin, from adversity, illness, from Satan, and from demons. Jesus is the great deliverer. He delivers humanity from the punishment of sin. 
He delivers humanity from the power of sin, from bondages, from diseases, danger, and evil spirits. In large measure, he does this through the practice of forgiveness. You may remember in Matthew 9, verses 2 through 6, Jesus heals a paralyzed man by declaring, he says, what? Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And he is delivered from his illness. 1 John 1.19 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That cleansing us from unrighteousness is deliverance from the effects of sin. Today, in today's parable, the king settles accounts with the chief accountant. The chief accountant, of course, very, 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 uh, is very excited about the fact that he no longer owes a debt. The king tells him, you are to forgive others the way in which I have forgiven you. But the chief servant doesn't forgive. What does he do? He tells them, you got to pay up. When the king hears this, he is enraged, he's angry, and he throws the unjust servant into prison. And then he turns him over to the tormentors. The point is that if you do not forgive, you open yourself up to demonic torment. That's pretty serious business. Ephesians 4.26 says, if, you're ang if, you ang if you are angry, do not sin. Let not sin control you. Do not let sin go, do not let anger go down on your wrath, lest you give the devil a foothold. That word foothold in the Greek is from the word we get Topology, tropic. It means territory. It means ground. In other words, when you continue to hold on to anger and resentment and bitterness, you give ground in your heart away to Satan or to demons. So, how do you avoid that? You give forgiveness. You provide forgiveness. Otherwise, your heart becomes hard. If you don't forgive, that resentment and that bitterness causes your heart to become hard. And it limits your ability to love. And to be loved. To be kind and to be gentle. It limits your ability to become like Christ. Learning to protect our souls is very important. Jesus teaches us how critical it is to our well-being. In Matthew 6, 9 through 15, Jesus taught his disciples to say what? The Lord's Prayer. And in the Lord's Prayer, we are taught, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Note there is a connection between forgiveness of doubt and deliverance from evil. I mean, the, 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 uh, deliver, uh, forgiveness of debts and debts and deliverance from evil. The principle in the kingdom of God in verse 14 and 15 goes on further to say, if you do not forgive others their sin, the Lord will not forgive you of your sin. That's how important it is. If you hold any unforgiveness in your own heart, the Lord is not going to forgive you. And if you do not have forgiveness, 
then you are subject to the torment of demons. So again, the inference here is between forgiveness. If if we do not forgive, we are very vulnerable to evil. Needless to say, evil is a really big deal. And so the question becomes, how many times are we to forgive? Ah! (laughs) Somebody went to school and did well at math. Seven times 70, right? That is per day. Oh, yeah. So, so when you get to 490, whether it's per day or per week or per month, you can quit, right? No. No, 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 no. No. You, you forgive and forgive and forgive until when? <laughs> you forgive until forgiveness is complete. Now, how do you know when forgiveness is complete? <laughs> well, for some of us, this comes quicker than others. <laughs> Uh, my memory is not as good as it used to be. But, ah, now you're cooking. <laughs> now you're cooking. Exactly. How many of you, uh, we all know that forgiveness is supposed to be automatic, right? And we can do that fairly easily from our head. We can say, I forgive you. And we do that because that's being obedient to what the Word of God says. For sure. But there's a whole lot much more to it about that. You know, we preach a lot about forgiveness, but we are not really helped very much in how to do it. Would you agree that is the truth? I think so. At least it has been in my life. I have listened to lots of preachers to tell me to forgive and to forgive. But I needed didn't give me much help on how to do it. Pardon? A nut and bolt explanation. Well, hopefully I'll give you a few nuts and bolts before we leave here today. (laughs) Okay. So let me first say there is a lot of confusion between forgiveness and unforgiveness. And on your page, one of your pages there, I have provided you several statements that identify the differences between or delineating the difference between forgiveness and unforgiveness. In the interest of time, there you go. It's on the back there. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go over them this morning. That's why I asked Aaron to reproduce them so you can take them home, keep them, and refer back to them. Okay? Sometimes people think that withholding forgiveness... They are hurting the person who hurt them. They think that that by withholding forgiveness, they are getting back and getting even with the person who hurt them. But that's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. It doesn't work that way. There are, there's a graphic, there is a very graphic illustration from ancient times that describes how unforgiveness works. In the days of the Roman Empire, if a person murdered or killed another person, and they were convicted of that murder, as their punishment, what they would have to do is have the corpse of the person they murdered strapped to their back. And they carried that person's body around with them everywhere they went. And the toxic fluids that came from that decaying body would enter into the pores of that person and poison them and they would eventually die. 
It was a death sentence. Horrible death sentence. Exactly. Living, living in unforgiveness is like strapping the unforgiven person to your back. The poison of holding on to unforgiveness seeps into your soul and corrupts your soul and fills you with poison. When you, un, when you fail to forgive, you become tied to the very thing that you hate. That's how important it is to understand the price you pay for unforgiveness. Forgiveness not only sets you free from spiritual bondage, but it also can set the other person free. Forgiveness releases you from absorbing the poison bitterness and resentment. Forgiveness means to cancel a debt, to grant relief of a payment, to pardon of an offense without extracting a penalty, to cease from feeling resentment, to choose not to hurt the one who hurt you, to have compassion on the offender. Do you agree all those things occur with forgiveness? Do you know where they found in the Bible? Where that's found in the Bible? It's there. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, he forgives my sin and heals my diseases. Well, let me give you the nuts and bolts. Okay. There are four words used in the New Testament that are used in the Greek for forgiveness. The first word is a feme. And it means to set yourself and others free from carrying a load of guilt and shame. Through, the through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, he becomes our scapegoat. Remember in the Old Testament? How the priest once a year would put his hand on the goat for the sins of the nation Israel and then release that goat into the desert. It was a transference of Israel's sin onto the goat. Well, that's what happens with us. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Along with that sin there is that sense of condemnation, shame, and guilt that is placed upon the Lamb. You no longer have to carry it. The term, a female, is used 174 times in 133 verses according to the Greek concordance. A good example of that is found in Luke 17 verse 4. You can look it up at home. <laughs> the next word is the thesis. And again, it is setting us free and others free from the prison of hate, bitterness, and resentment. We are released from captivity to malice due to our debt having been paid. We owe nothing. Obligations for wrongs are erased. Criminals are let go as though the crime had never been committed. There is a remission of penalty. All reproach is forfeited and disapproval and disappointment is put aside, is put to an end. So it's like this. When Jesus forgives you, it's as though you never committed the sin in the first place. It's thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. That's called grace. Yes? What was the first word? 
A female? In English, it is forgiveness, but it has the connotation or the meaning of placing guilt and shame on Jesus, which really belonged to us. That was the first one. Yeah, that was the first one. The second one is uh, uh, a thesis, and that has to do with releasing bitterness and resentment and hatred, and again, placing that on Jesus. Okay. And that's translated as grace. It is all, all of this is grace. Forgiveness is grace. All of it comes under grace. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So Meaning that, that by, the, by the definition of the way in which the word is used. Okay. So. Uh, as you well know, Greek has many meanings for one word that we have to use several words in the English language. That's why it gets different shades of meaning. Okay? It's important that you understand that in order to fully know when you completely have forgiven. Okay? All right, so the third word is apoyo. Incidentally, there should be a sheet of all this that you should have. Is there any more around? Okay. All right. Well, polio sets us free. It means to dismiss, to loosen, to let go of, to no longer detain, to send away, to release, to acquit from a crime, to release from debt, to release a prisoner from prison, in case of divorce, it means to send the other person away. And it is, again, a legal transaction. A polio is a legal transaction. So that when you are, when Jesus died on the cross, and you accepted his grace, his forgiveness, a legal transaction took place in heaven which entitles you to all the inheritance that is in Christ Jesus. There is a legal transaction that takes place. That's the word apoyo. And it's found 89 times in 63 verses in the Greek concordance. And the example is found in Luke 6, verse 37. Now, the last of the four words is charizome. Charizome is used in a way to offer forgiveness to us and others. It sets them free and us from the compulsion to punish. Instead of demanding vengeance for the offense, we are free to show mercy and favor. Kindness replaces revenge. We are free to bless rather than curse. Do something agreeable, pleasant, and offer a grace instead of demanding justice. It occurs 24 times in the scriptures in 19 verses. And the text, the example of that is found in 2 Corinthians 2.7. So when you have been hurt terribly, when you have been hurt terribly by someone close to you who betrays you, how do you know that you have totally forgiven? All four of those dimensions of forgiveness are applicable to your life. When you can get to the point where you can bless someone who hurts you, you are getting to the place where you're fully, fully forgiven them. If you can't do that, there's some more work to be done in your heart. So there are four dimensions, four dimensions of forgiveness, but there are, I mean, excuse me, I didn't say dimensions, I got confused. Four aspects of forgiveness, but then there are three dimensions of forgiveness. And what are those three dimensions? 
Whenever you are trying to work through a process of moving from unforgiveness to forgiveness, there are three things you need to consider. First of all, it's on a horizontal plane. That means you forgive someone who hurt you. You're all familiar with that one, right? Huh? Lateral. Lateral, Lateral, exactly. It goes like this. It's lateral or horizontal. Somebody somebody hurts my feelings, does something, steals from me. I I forgive them. That is a lateral or horizontal forgiveness. But I am ticked off. I am angry. I don't want anything to do with that person. In fact, I will do everything I can to get even with them. I'm going to go steal from them. That's what I'm saying in my heart. And so what do I have to do? I have to ask God to forgive me for the sinful way in which I responded to the hurt. And then when I receive his forgiveness, then we form what? A cross. Horizontal and vertical. But that's not the last dimension. The last dimension is inner dimension. And that inner dimension is forgiving yourself. Sometimes forgiving yourself is the hardest thing to do. Why? Why is it hard to forgive yourself? I should have known better. I'm supposed to be a Christian. I'm such an unworthy person. I got filled with so much guilt, so much resentment, so much pain and hurt. I don't deserve to be forgiven. It's at that point, that's when you need forgiveness the most. And you have to apply God's forgiveness to yourself as though you were forgiving another person. When you, when you use all four aspects of forgiveness and you also use all three dimensions of forgiveness, then you are getting to the place where forgiveness is complete. So how do you know when it is complete? Well, you know it's mostly this way. If you're still having any revenge in your heart, it's not complete. If there's any slander or gossip in your mouth, it's not complete. If there is a sense of rejection you have toward other people in which you give them the cold shoulder, forgiveness is not complete. When you resist any cooperation, in other words, you withhold your cooperation with a person, forgiveness is not complete. When you have any sense that they still owe you something, forgiveness is not complete. When you transfer your affection from that person to someone else, in other words, withhold your affection from them and give it to someone else, Forgiveness is not complete. When you are full of bigotry, that is to say, hold on to unreasonable beliefs and prejudices about that person, forgiveness is not complete. When you have the inability to bless that person, forgiveness is not complete. When you secretly want to see something bad happen to that person, forgiveness is not complete. And when you still hold bitterness and contempt and anger in your heart, bitterness is not complete. And this is a real sneaky one. (laughs) Bitterness is a real deceiving one. It's it's probably one of the, the... the most difficult to get in touch with. 
Most of us, let me ask you, most of you don't think of yourself as a bitter person, do you? Huh? I didn't think of myself as a bitter person. But when I do what David says, search your heart, oh God, and see if there's any evil way in me. Whoa, guess what pops up? Some buried, repressed feelings of where people did me wrong. The Bible says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with all forms of malice. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as Christ has forgiven you. So, how do you know if you have any buried bitterness in your heart? There's another page out there I gave to you. You may be bitter if... You may be bitter if. If your heart is turned hard, if you have a hardened heart, you may still be holding on to some bitterness. Bitterness can strain your relationships within your family and across generations. What do you mean by that? Well, let me tell you a story. Not too long ago, I was counseling with a man, a very sharp man, who was in the U.S. service. He was in a very high-profile position. He had command of 150 men. And over the course of his lifetime, his self-esteem and his sense of manhood just began to erode. He eventually got addicted to alcohol in order to try to comfort himself in the pain he was carrying. And in that time, he did some things that put him into, made some bad decisions, which put him in a place of great financial hurt. He was in a lot of debt. And his relationship with his wife was really rocky. And so he comes to see me, and one of the things that we learn as the Holy Spirit begins to reveal and uncover some of the stuff down into his heart, that he comes from generations of people who carried hurt and bitterness in their hearts. His grandfather lived in Lithuania. He was Jewish. The, Ger the Russians came, took over Lithuania, and was going to conscript him into the Russian army for 25 years. He was a landowner. He was a farmer. But in order to escape the Russian oppression, his grandfather left Lithuania and came to America seeking freedom. In America, because he was Jewish, he suffered prejudice. He suffered anti-Semitism. And he wasn't really prosperous, and he became living in poverty, and he became bitter, and he became angry, and he resorted to alcohol to comfort in his pain. His son, the father of this arm, serf, arms, army service person, was a very sharp individual. He actually became a high-ranking government official who was a representative and ambassador to foreign countries. His father traveled a lot. His father was absent in his life. And as a result of that, his father became a workaholic, basically. So what happened was the addiction 
that his grandfather had to alcohol just changed forms and became addiction to workaholism. Then because of the absence of the father in the home, the son began to drink alcohol when everyone was away from the house. He would sneak into the cupboard and drink alcohol by himself and he became addicted at nine years old. Nine years of age. And he continued this addiction until it got to the place where he couldn't handle it anymore and he went through two rehab centers. So the, all of this is coming out, this generational curse that is upon his family, the iniquities, the consequential sins of unforgiveness. And now he himself is being tormented. His life is falling apart. And so the Holy Spirit, it's the first time ever in a session <laughs> that the Holy Spirit led me to do this. But I asked him, I said, can you forgive the Russians? for what they did to your grandfather. And he said yes. And when he verbally forgave the Russians for what they did to his family, the Holy Spirit came flooding in, powerful, and just washed the room clean. So unforgiveness goes through generation to generation. And that the de demons that affected his grandfather was now affecting him. And now he just closed the door. Hallelujah. So the question that I, arises for us, is there any area in your life and in your family's life where there is unforgiveness. Where there is a continual holding on to resentment, bitterness, or grudges that you might have. I want to tell you if you do, ask the Holy Spirit to point it out to you. And then ask the Lord's forgiveness so that you can be washed clean and that the door can be closed and you will be free to prosper. Free to be in good health. Free to fulfill the destiny that God has designed for you. How much more time do we have? Half an hour. Half an hour. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with this. Do any of you know the name Ernest Hemingway? Ernest Hemingway. Ernest Hemingway was a very popular and well-known writer, novelist. He wrote several books, and he wrote a short story. And the short story is entitled, The Capital of the World. And it's a story about a man and his son. It takes place in Spain. And at that point in time, there were a very popular name that was given to boys. The popular name was Paco. And so he named his son Paco. Now Paco and his dad didn't get along too well. Because Paco wanted to become a matador in Spain and the capital of Madrid. That's where the short story gets its title, the capital, in Madrid. The father follows his son Paco into the city of Madrid, seeking to reconcile with him, seeking to find him. And so in this large capital, how is he going to do that? This big city, how is he going to find his son? So he goes to the newspaper and he takes out an ad. And in the ad he says something on the order of 
Dear Paco, meet me on the steps of the newspaper building. I love you. All is forgiven. Meet me tomorrow. I love you. All is forgiven. The next day, when the father goes to the newspaper building, there are 800 Pacos. Why? Because everyone needs forgiveness. All is forgiven. Everybody knows that they need forgiveness. And that is what we are about here today. Is to get inside of that understanding of forgiveness. Apply the nuts and bolts to our forgiveness. So let me ask you, do you need forgiveness today? Forgiveness and what? Forgiveness and neighbors. And neighbors. That's a struggle as you get more and increasing in the womb of the human condition and the human aspect. I think in all fairness. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, very, it's very much a part of the human condition. Right. Is, is because we also have a sinful nature mm-hmm. called the flesh that we have to wrestle against. And it's that flesh that doesn't want to forgive. Because we have been wrong. We should be the ones that is, is being repaid, right? That's our sense of justice. But the scriptures sets a different understanding of the power of forgiveness. And it is that forgiveness that enables us to keep that person a neighbor. <laughs> Otherwise, we are not going to be in a right relationship with him. Forgiveness is critically important in righteousness. Righteousness is being in right relationship with God and with others. This is something we have to work at, right? All the time. Yes, ma'am. Pardon? Oh, yes. Okay. Very good, I will. Forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. Okay? Forgiveness sets the direction toward reconciliation, but it's not the same. For example, an abuser. You can forgive an abuser, and you can forgive them to the place where you're completely forgiven, but it doesn't mean you're going to trust them because they have not showed themselves to be worthy of having been transformed. And that's discernment. That's just good judgment. You don't want to put yourself into those places where you're subject to that kind of danger. But I want to tell you this. If you are walking in righteousness, if you have applied forgiveness, your ability to discern increases. So forgiveness has another added benefit of providing you a lifestyle of righteousness that enables you to discern evil from good and good from evil. Okay? Um, The other thing is this. It's just as important to learn how to receive forgiveness as it is to give forgiveness. Just as important. So many people can give a little bit of forgiveness, but you can't give forgiveness, any, any more forgiveness than what you yourself have received. Remember the, remember the woman who was uh, cleansing Jesus' feet? putting oil in his feet, rubbing it with his hair. And the Pharisee 
complains about this woman. He says, if you knew what kind of woman she was, she was a harlot. If you knew what kind of woman she was, you wouldn't even let her touch you. And Jesus says, he really calls this Pharisee to task. Well, you didn't wash my feet when I came in. But here she is, and he goes on to say, those who love much have been forgiven much. Those who love much have been forgiven much. And I take, I take away from that is this. The more you are able to forgive and the more you're able to receive forgiveness, the greater your capacity is to love. That's where that transformation takes place. And so one of the key elements in, in being transformed into the likeness of Christ is learning to receive forgiveness, not from your head, but into your heart. And there's a whole, th- a whole understanding of how that happens. How many of you believe you're forgiven? Okay. Pardon? And then, yeah, exactly. And then how many of you feel like you haven't been forgiven? Pardon? I still don't understand. Oh, okay. I said, how many of you have feel like you have been forgiven? Everybody raise their hands. Okay. Uh, how, I mean, I mean, said, how many believe they have been forgiven? Right. Then I said, how many times after you believe you're forgiven, something creeps up on you and you feel like you haven't been forgiven? Does that ever happen to you? Yeah, yeah it does. It does. So the question then is, if that is the case, either you're listening to demons who's trying to condemn you all over again, or you haven't fully forgiven from your heart. Let me just give you a short little thumbnail sketch of how this works. How do, you, how, how do you receive forgiveness? First of all, get into the presence of God. When you are in the presence of God, you ask for forgiveness for whatever the Holy Spirit points out to you, whatever it might be. And then you say, I receive your forgiveness, Lord. And then you wait. You wait. You wait in the presence until you are confident that you know that you know, until you have a peace that passes understanding, until you are at rest, until you are able to move with confidence knowing that it's all in the past, it's done. And you're not dragging anything with you. And all that takes place in your heart. So many times, we, I think the church says, you are forgiven. But we don't like time. We don't allow time for that forgiveness to manifest in our hearts. It stays on the surface. It stays in our heads. But once you have felt the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit doing the cleansing work in your heart, which results in peace and calmness and a sense of blessing and joy, then you know it's a done deal. Until then, you're carrying a little bit of doubt whether or not you have been forgiven. Right? That's the way it is. Well, I am finished. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Sure. Uh, if they don't know, if they don't have these papers, um, 
We can try to maybe see you and then get a copy. But we can go over them real quick. Um, which ones do you want to do? The bitterness? The difference is the nuts. Just read down over it. Maybe spend a couple minutes, five minutes on the sheet. Okay. All right, let me go over what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. Okay. What forgiveness is not. It is not approval of the wrong. God hates sin. God doesn't approve of sin. It's wrong. It's not approval. Forgiveness is not giving approval to what was done that's wrongly committed against you. It is not excusing the wrong. It is not justifying the wrong or to argue the act as a right, reasonable, evil cannot be justified. It is not pardoning the wrong, dismissing legal consequences. Someone commits murder, does time in jail. At least they should. (laughs) They have to pay back their debt, protect society, testify against to be testified that they're no longer, that their heart is full of malice, that they are been transformed and, and able to come back in society and no longer be a threat. It's not reconciliation, to answer the question that was early, asked questions. It's not denying the wrong ever occurred. Sometimes people think, well, if I forgive you, it's, it's not like I have never been transgressed against. No, you still have a memory of that. It's not turning a blind eye to wrong and avoiding the pain. Sometimes we'll say we'll forgive them and we'll just squash and repress the pain that we feel. No, that's not it. And then it's not refusing to take the wrong seriously and minimizing the infraction. Oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really, it really doesn't really count for much. I I really don't have to really uh, take that seriously. Uh, a sin, an infraction, an offense is still there. You have to recognize it. And it's not pretending that you're not hurt. How many of you say, have been in a situation where somebody hurt you and you would never admit it? That's not forgiveness. You've got to get in touch with the pain. Yes. That's true. We should answer it in such a way as, uh, yes, I forgive you for what you did against me, and I thank you for apologizing. What you're saying is we should not say, I forgive you, it's no big deal. Correct. We should never do that. Correct. We should say, I forgive you, thank you for apologizing, it really did hurt. Exactly. And yeah, and then when you start that conversation, and they are willing to hear how bad you've been hurt, then you're working toward reconciliation. Yes, when they recognize how, how badly they hurt you and you're just not letting them off the hook, then you're beginning to work toward reconciliation. Okay. So what, uh, what complete forgiveness is? It fully acknowledges the wrong. Yeah, there was a wrong done. Yeah, yeah. It keeps no record of wrong, however. Love does not keep any record of wrong. That's right. So if you do something to hurt your wife, and then you go and ask forgiveness, and she gives you forgiveness, if she is truly forgiving you, she never brings that up again. Doesn't ever use that against you. Doesn't use that to manipulate you or to make you feel guilty in some way. No, it's gone. It refuses to get even or to punish or to take revenge. It refuses to talk about the one who did wrong. Whoever would foster love covers over an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends, according to Proverbs 17, 9. Uh, 
No, that's not the same. Okay. You can't cover over an offense. If you think you're covering over offense by pretending you never were hurt, that's not a covering an offense. That is a lie. <laughs> okay. When you cover over an offense is you no longer hold that person in contempt. You are free to love. So what you do is, a uh, way I would put it is you cover over the offense with love. And to do that, you have to have the heart of Jesus Christ. You're saying acceptance. Acknowledgement. Acknowledgement. Accepting bad behavior is not, is not, is not forgiveness. But you're saying acceptance. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Jesus never, Jesus didn't, would not approve of all the torment and all of the persecution and all of the pain and all of the hurt that he experienced on the cross. But he forgave them because they did not know what they were doing. He forgave them. It's not the fact that he approved of what they did. He surrendered himself to the Father, subjecting himself to the cruelty of men in order to fulfill his purpose of providing forgiveness and a way back to re- being reconciled to the Father. Then we're accepting yep. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. It is merciful, refusing to enact justice, leaving justice to God. That's an important one because we still want to hold on to our own personal judgments. And number six it is gracious, extending goodwill, delight, joy, favor, and blessing. It is something that takes place in the heart, not simply in your head. Your heart being the innermost part of your being, your soul, which becomes, takes into your will, your feelings, your beliefs. It is, it is absence of bitterness. It releases disappointment with God. It refuses to hold grudges against yourself or others. All right, I got just five more minutes here. How many of you, how many of you have been disappointed with God? Okay. So you're holding on to hurt because God didn't meet your expectations. And secretly, you don't want to blame God, but you still hold it against Him. If you're going to have freedom, you've got to renounce, you've got to accept the fact that you have the wrong perception of what took place. You're seeing it from your perspective and not from God's. And you need to renounce the fact and let go of that disappointment and ask God's forgiveness for having misjudged him as the one who is in the wrong. Okay. We can do this short, in the short term. All right. Heavenly Father, we recognize that there have been events in our life in which we have blamed you, and you have not been the fault. We will place the blame where it really belongs, on ourselves or on Satan. We ask you to forgive us for judging you improperly. We thank you, O Lord, for your forgiveness and for your understanding and for the freedom we now have. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We've got to practice what we preach. We've got to practice what we preach. Be still. Let that forgiveness drop right into your heart. 
Wait. Wait until it's there. When you have a sense of being confident that you are forgiven, when you have a sense of a weight being lifted off your shoulders, when you have a sense of relief, a sense of peace that overcomes you, when joy begins to begin to well up in your heart, raise your hand. Those of you who have received forgiveness, go ahead and give thanks to the Lord. Those that you're still waiting, doesn't mean it's not coming, it just hasn't settled in yet. So I would, I would invite you that after the service or sometime in home, again go into the presence of the Lord and confess your disappointment in whatever way, whatever shape it has, and to receive it, receive forgiveness from the Lord. Sometimes very, it's very hard to be able to connect at that deep level when you're in a company of lots of folks <laughs> and there's a lot of noise and things going on. So when you can get focused and you are in the presence, just you and the Lord, Revisit, revisit that disappointment and confess it all over again and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. Okay? I would like you to uh, do a prayer yet for uh, that we could receive more of God's love so that we can actually give. You know, it talks about He has received much uh, can give much away. Okay. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being the one who restores and heals our broken hearts, who brings wholeness to those areas in our life that have been wounded. In those places where we feel cut off and isolated, we thank you, O oh Lord, for your goodness and your grace. Your word promises that one day all things will be restored to wholeness without sin in the new heaven and the new earth. We thank you, O oh Lord, that however you continue to work in our lives to restore relationships between people and between yourself, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, we are in a place where we sometimes separate ourselves from where we want to be and from the people we want to be with. We ask that you would grant us greater measures of grace to come closer to you and closer to those people in our families, those people in our neighborhoods, so that we might display the love of Jesus more fully, more completely. 
Help us, O Lord, to apply all that we have learned today about the nature of forgiveness so that we can be completely delivered and empowered by your Holy Spirit, that our spirits would be restored and refreshed, that there will be no areas in which the evil one can have access to our lives, that we are no longer under the oppression of the demonic spirits, but that we can walk in greater degrees of freedom. We ask, O Lord, that your word be released into every heart, a word that brings a sense of peace, a future, a, 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 an, an optimism, an expectation, a greater measure of faith, of receiving what you have in store for us by way of both re positive relationships, economic prosperity, and uh, in empowering our ability to witness. We ask, O oh Lord, that your grace would come and empower us and grant us the, uh, the, the desires of our hearts to serve you without reservation, without holding anything back. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.